dining out as entertainment, the chef as the main attraction, eating local and an emphasis on distinctly American cuisine? Who is responsible for all this? A name you might not even know. Chef Jeremiah Tower. My name is Elizabeth Alfano, host of the TV show, web series, and podcast, The Celebrity Dinner Party. At the Four Seasons in Los Angeles, I dish with Chef Tower, who is the subject of the film, Jeremiah Tower, The Last Magnificent, which was released on April 21st, 2017. If you aren't familiar with Chef Tower, his story plays like a modern drama. In the late 70s and early 80s, Tower was a revolutionary and regaled chef at Chez Panisse. In 1985, he left to launch his legendary Stars Restaurant in San Francisco. Stars was the birthplace of the chef as celebrity and the excitement of the kitchen as an evening on the town's main event, not to mention the invention of the distinctly American Nouvelle Cuisine. Years later, Tower abruptly closed Stars and left the culinary scene altogether for an extended self-imposed exile. No one knew where he was, only to pop up 15 years later in New York City at the seemingly obviously mismatched establishment of the very rocky Tavern on the Green. The just released movie of his life, executive produced by Anthony Bourdain and directed by Lydia Tanaglia, might as well have been called The Rise and Fall of Jeremiah Tower. Will a third act prevail? Drama to say the least. So sit tight, grab a glass of champagne, and listen in. After a quick word about podcasts, I'll be right back with the one and only, the man who started it all and put America on the map for culinary excellence, Chef Jeremiah Tower. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast, The Celebrity Dinner Party, with me, Elizabeth Alfano, on iTunes. Just search for The Celebrity Dinner Party, Or, if SoundCloud is your thing, you can find me there, too, by searching for The Celebrity Dinner Party. Subscribe, and you'll never have to hunt for engaging and inspiring interviews again. They'll just land on your computer or your iPhone every time a new podcast comes out. So subscribe now to The Celebrity Dinner Party with me, Elizabeth Alfano, because the best conversations really do happen over dinner. Thanks for joining me, Elizabeth Alfano with the Celebrity Dinner Party. I have Jeremiah Tower with me today, so such an enormous treat. Oh, thank you. Treat for me, too. So your new movie is out. Executive producer Anthony Bourdain has put together a movie called Jeremiah Tower, The Last Magnificent. Slightly embarrassing title for me, but a great title. Suits your bon vivant nature, I would say. (laughs) It's actually hard to have this interview without a glass of champagne in hand. Almost impossible. Almost impossible. So we are 11 a.m. here in Los Angeles, which is the only reason that we don't have champagne on a weekday. Otherwise, really, if I interview you, I really should have a drink in hand. Except 11 o'clock in the morning is the perfect time for a glass of champagne. That's when your palate is the most receptive. Oh, you I mean, you're see? starting to get hungry for lunch, and what you know, the best introduction for lunch is a glass of champagne. Gosh, And your palate it. is ready for it by 11 o'clock. Okay, and your stomach as well? Absolutely. If you got up at, you know, 6 or 7 o'clock, 11 is when your palate is at its most receptive in the 24 hours. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. That's wonderful to know. So for food as well. Absolutely. Too. Oh, gosh. Yeah. That's, see, okay, so we're going to get lots of tricks of the trade from you before this interview <laughs> is over. Um, I just want to take people through, if that's okay with you, kind of the arc of the film, yeah. and which is really the arc of your life, and then that way we can get into the nitty-gritty once I Good. get everybody up to Good. speed. Good. So, again, I would say very much a love letter to you from Anthony Bourdain, really sort of giving you a spotlight in history for those who may not know about you. Right. So starting from the very early age, uh, as a young child, you were sort of abandoned, for lack of a better expression, by your parents and left to your own devices. Even though they were around, they sort of had other things on their mind, we'll say. 
That's, I mean, it's portrayed that way in the film. And, you know, in this day and age, I mean, my childhood would look like abuse. I mean, but it's, so it's impossible for people to realize that um, it was a perfect childhood for me because, you know, I was staying at the greatest hotels in the world, going on the best ships in the world, traveling around the world. I mean, a couple of times I, I once went around the world by myself when I was 16. So I didn't feel abandoned. I felt privileged, you know. As in the film, they showed me that being served the cup of consomme yes. on the Queen Elizabeth, um, and you know, I just that was a moment. I thought, well, if this is first class, I never want to give this up. Well, so I wasn't abandoned at all. I was living the high l- lifestyle. So yes, you were living at a very young age, even yeah. much earlier than sixteen. You were yes. living the high lifestyle, right. and um, taking very much to heart the idea of entertaining people and having the best experience possible and sort of over-the-top luxury, if you will. But then you sort of, we shift, we fast forward, we go to Harvard and you're studying architecture. And then you, again, I'm just giving the big arc for people so they can follow up on your life. So you get out of Harvard at around 30 and you're like, I'm really not sure what to do, but I've always loved cooking. You had discovered food as a child because it was so much fun to be in and out of the kitchens when your parents weren't around on this boat or that plane or that restaurant. And uh, so you sort of stumble into Chez Panisse and... You have an incredible career there. At the time, this would have been in the 70s, right? right? You, um, it was really a, a French bistro, southern French cuisine. Yeah, Mediterranean bistro. Absolutely yeah, right. Exactly. But, and you had some historic, I think Anthony Bourdain says now, those menus that you created are historical right. documents, really, um, of wow, historical that's nice importance. Of Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then you sort of, as the chef, you went for a switch and you really wanted to focus on American cuisine. And then we come to know you as the father of American cuisine, the father of French um, Californian cuisine, right, really. Right. Uh, and so you leave Chez Panisse and you go on your own to have stars, which stars, I will just say, is the first of almost everything in American cuisine. So we have the chef coming out of the kitchen. Right. He's there to entertain and to be the center of attention. And you have dining as entertainment and you have this focus on local food and celebrities and the whole bit. Uh, and then you leave stars and you go into self-imposed exile for about 10 years. Right. You come back and you go to Tavern on the Green, and that is a short-lived experience. So with that sort of arc of your life, now I'll get into the real questions. Okay. Where did you go and what did you do for almost 15 years of self-imposed exile? I went to uh, New Orleans. First I went to New York and wrote two books. A company, an Asian company, uh, had bought the Stars Group, and then they, I ran, helped them run for about a year, and then they went on for another year or so. I went to New York, wrote two books. Uh, 9-11 happened. I thought, yes. okay, because I lived very close by. I thought, you know, maybe I won't stay here. I went to New Orleans. And then before I unpacked and got settled and everything, I thought, well, I'll just go to Cozumel for a quick mm-hmm. dive vacation, pull my head together, and, you know, come back and settle and get organized in New Orleans. Um, and then Katrina hit when I was in Cozumel. So I was suddenly homeless and possessionless. And about 40 margaritas later, I said to myself, well, I mean, if you're going to be homeless, you might as well be on a tropical island. So I didn't look back. And then, you know, eight months later, Wilma, which was the biggest hurricane ever recorded, decided to vaporize that little tropical island called Cozumel. And so then I moved inland. No earthquakes, no terrorists, no hurricanes. One would hope. You know, one would hope. Yes. <laughs> Never really sure. And then so I moved into the, the Yucatan because by that time I really was enjoying Mexico and was fascinated by the cuisine in Yucatan. And so I stayed there. And you are still in Mexico, is that right? Well, half the time I was in Cozumel diving and half the time I was writing books in Merida. And you didn't miss food? Working in the food industry, or or did you still dabble in some ways? I know you were writing books right. pertaining to food, but that's different than the artist really touching and working in food. Which is what Wolfgang Puck says in the movie. You know, where's Jeremiah? I mean, he was born to do this. Well, I mean, you know, after uh, thirty-five years or thirty years of shaking three hundred and fifty hands of yes. clients a day, I just I needed a balance. You know, so mm-hmm. the quiet of uh, tropical island was perfect. 
Yes, it's an interesting, and so many questions for you today, but it's a very interesting thing about your personality. In, in some ways, you say in the movie that you're a loner, that you're quite, I think you open the movie with saying, I need to stay away from people. Well, you know, I got so enthusiastic about uh, talking to Lydia and the camera crew and just, you know, saying whatever came to mind and not trying to be careful that I sent her the, the I downloaded, you know, all the things in my notebooks when I was at Harvard when I was 19 years old, you know, uh, taking mescaline, smoking dope and, you know, living that style in 1962, whatever it was. So I, I sent her, I gave them to her. I hadn't read them in, since 1962. She picked up that one, you know, I'm not a human being. And I thought, the movie opens like that. And I just thought, oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Lydia turned to me at the premiere of the Tribeca Film Festival and said, are you going to hit me? I said, no, listen, the crowd, the theater is dead silent. It wasn't a peep. That's how, I th- that's how powerful me. that was. As well. But then you've got this dichotomy where you are a, a bit of a loner or you, you need to stay away from people sometimes. Like, as you say in Cozumel, you took a break. But you've got that bon vivant nature, and that usually means other people. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's an odd dichotomy that, <clears throat> excuse me, you need to be around others to right. celebrate, to create, to make the event the best it can be. And at the same time, you really want to keep your distance. And that's got to be hard to walk that line. Well, in hospitality, I mean, why, if you're going to do it at all, get fully involved. Jump in and swim around in it, you know. But that also means, you know, if you have the energy to do that, you recuperate in a bit of silence, at least for me. Yes, and I would say that with anything. If you're going to do it, you have to commit 100%. Absolutely. And then at the same time, and I find this very true for lots of artists because I interview a lot of artists, you're so busy creating that sometimes you have to step back and just for, you know, some people it's three weeks in front of the TV and not talking to people right, or right. some people Bad novels or bad movies. Yes, right. You really, for as much as you create, you almost need equal balance letting yes. the creativity come to you, taking right. it in rather than giving it out. When I first, uh, after about the first six or eight months at Chez Panisse, I was working 90 hours a week because I'd get up at four, you know, I mean, five o'clock in the morning, go shopping, come back cooked lunch for 50 people all by myself, and then cooked dinner for 100 with one assistant and the dishwasher, of course. Um, and that was six days a week, and on this, my day off was doing all the business, the administration, the menus for the next week. And at one, point, one night, I just went, I'm done. Yeah. I'm cooked. I mean, I'm a cook, I'm cooked. So I went out to Alice, and I said, I'm out of here. See you next week. I went to this little place called Yalapa on the west coast of Mexico. I love Yalapa. And I, there wasn't anyone there. I mean, there were two other guests in this hotel. There was only one hotel. And I went to the bartender in the morning. I said, see that hedge over there? I'll be on the other side of that all day. Keep the drinks coming. Every 15 minutes, I want a fresh margarita while I think. (laughs) I, I completely understand. Yalapa is such a little haven. Yeah. I was there and I stayed in a sort of an outside hut and there was no one else. There were maybe seven huts. There was no one else except me and my hut and two anteaters. Oh, yeah. so I really <laughs> liked Yalapa a lot. But So after two days of that, you know, I'd had enough margaritas. After two days of that, I had my plan for the next few years at Chez Panisa. In that silence, I mean, you get a little sleep. Your brain starts to work again, and out of that silence, the ideas start to form. Yes, and I also think people often forget what a physically demanding job it is to be a chef. So not just the hours and not just how many days a week, but you're constantly on your feet. Right. Constantly standing up. It's a very demanding job. Very. But then, so you you take, you, here we were talking about a little break to uh, Yalapa, but you also have this long, almost 15 years, I think, self-imposed exile where you're doing some other things and you're writing yeah. books, but you're you're taking a big, long break from cooking. Right. You get back into it at Tavern on the Green. Why? Because I have a fatal attraction for the slim chance, and that was about as slim a chance as it gets. So it was a challenge for yourself. Oh, huge challenge, yeah. But, I mean, that's why you chose it, is you wanted that challenge. Absolutely. As, you know, Proust said, you know, you, you work and to see if the light is still on. Mm-hmm. I want to see if my light was still on, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
And I realized it was. I just didn't want to do a big restaurant. Mm-hmm. Well, so I think of this movie title, and I really encourage everyone to see it because there is so much drama, and the music is so well oh, done, and the filming is so lovely, yeah. and so in so many ways, um, they have done a great job. But I think of this. You say in the beginning of the movie, it's hard. One of the hardest things about life is when you think that maybe your dreams aren't being realized or your dreams aren't coming true. Right. And I wonder for you, do you feel that you have set out what you wanted to accomplish? Are there still more dreams to come? Is there a third act in this? Yes, and of course that comment was also from when I was uh, 19. She was ruthless in using all that material, you know, from... uh, but I think they were perfect in the movie because they, yes. they are as appropriate for right now, seeing the movie, as then. So that either means I haven't changed that much or, you know, whatever. So I'm always thinking of the next, uh, the next step or the next three because... Three ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, it takes that kind of concentration if you want a book published unless you're you know, a famous author. So I just got back from Seville, and I saw a, a property that a friend of mine just bought, 200 acres of olive trees, and a borgo, which is so it has a 15th century church and a huge factory and a great big house and everything on the top of a little mountain. And I just thought, oh, my God. So... Uh, is this in the works for a this restaurant? This is in the works. No, restaurant, we're not quite sure. Well, it'll be a retreat oh, or... But, you know, it's, um, I was fascinated because the, I met with the mayor and all the people from the agricultural district, and they're all saying, you know, all our olive tree of properties are being abandoned because they're so expensive to run. Mm. And I said, well, you know, if you, you know, there are ways to find money to run them, um, and I'll think of them, you know, in the next six months. <laughs> So it may be an orchard as well as a retreat. Oh, or... and a teaching of the, you know, how to bring oh. back the original farming. And, so, and I talked to Lydia this morning. I said, Lydia, you have to make a movie about this. Oh, that's Because it involves the region. Idea. Andalusia it involves the EU. It involves, which is already very much up in the air these days. So I think it could be a great story. It could be books and videos oh, on yes. cooking and techniques. And how did they crush olives? The, the olive press is 250 years yeah. old. You know. And, of course, many of the best cooking utensils haven't changed. You say an olive press is 200 years old. I mean, some of the best things are and, remain, you know. And shouldn't. And shouldn't. Exactly right. And I shouldn't. always, a modern pestle, you make a garlic mayonnaise, and I only, I in, a go, say, in, a, in a modern pestle, <laughs> it's light, it has more flavor, it has more perfume, it has a better appearance. And on your body, you don't get that garlic for 24 hours, that, ah. you know, repeating what, if you make it in a machine, there's a certain amount of oxidization occurs, you know, there's heat. So the least violence in winemaking and cooking is the way to go. And then you're saying you're, so, not, you're not wasting the product either because you're not getting some of its essential juices. And right, you're getting everything, everything that you need there. in the most oh. gentle way. Um, so I, I'm just dying to get that old press moving again. So is there a timeline for this that we might be able to look for? No, I just started, just started, so, oh, um, yeah, this year sometime. Well, uh, let me ask you, um, you know, we talked a little bit about there being so many firsts for you, so bringing the chef out as star and bringing um, food as entertainment, right. forget the play later or the movie later, now right. you've got, you know, dining at stars is sure. all the entertainment you need, and then this focus on American cuisine, you You are responsible for all of those. And as we look today at Farm to Table, I mean, it's directly linked back to you. And yet many people don't know your name. Do you feel that history has done you a disservice? No, because... No, I don't. And, you know, I I never thought about that way. People now looking at the story, looking back, you try and reconstruct how it happened. So cooking at Chapinese, we were changing, you know, the face of a nation, culinary face of a nation. Did I know? Of course not. I was trying to pay the bills. I was trying to fill up the restaurant. You know, I didn't... I just knew uh, from my whole childhood and everything that ingredients were where it all starts and where it ends, Mm -hmm. you know. The green bean story, you know, all of that. So, um, 
Now I've lost track of the old yes, yes, yes. I've lost track. Well, yes, that, that you, Put don't us back feel, on track. you don't feel that history has done you a disservice. No, no, absolutely yes. not. In yeah. fact, if it had, I wouldn't have lost track. <laughs> <laughs> no, history is not... I don't feel that history has done me a disservice. At one point, years ago, Time magazine said that I had had more publicity than Meryl Streep. And I just thought, well, true or not, their point is interesting, is that how could a cook become as famous as a movie star, or almost as famous as a movie star. It's just preposterous, right? And that was their point, you yeah. know, how, how a celebrity chef is made. Yes, I mean, and you were sort of the first of the celebrity chefs. I'll right. even say sort of chef as sex symbol there for a while, too. So, I mean, it, it was really an exciting time. I, Chez Panisse, for sure, but particularly right. stars. And so I'll ask you, because I think it's an assumption that maybe it's not accurate, was there a lot of joy at that time? Was there joy in that? Because, I, again, going back to running a restaurant, first we were talking about the difficulties of being a chef, right. let alone a chef and a restaurateur. So, right. oh, my word, the pressure, and it's no wonder you sent yourself away to Mexico and to other places for some, some time to get away. So was it filled with joy all that time, most of it? Most of it was joyful because, uh, as you see that thing on that Saturday night, at stars, you know, in the, in the film. Yeah. Um, when it's like that, everybody's on full high. You know, the staff, the public, the everything. I mean, it's an extraordinary feeling when a great restaurant is working very well. Um, I mean, you can... It's also challenging when it's not working well to make it wonderful for people. But it's not this... You don't get high from that. Yes. You don't get the same kind of joy yeah. from it. But I loved those years at Stars. I mean, you know, it was um, all-consuming, but that's fine. I like that. I would think addictive as well, which is why oh. the separation for so long. I'm surprised you didn't get back into the game earlier, that it took you almost 15 years to get back to Tavern on the Green. I think, I mean, all else. the chefs, like, like uh, performers, uh, are adrenaline junkies. Yes, you know? yes. I mean, in the film, you see the reenactment of Margot Fontaine, and then she went, she was quite a good friend. Rudolf Nureyev was a very good friend. And they stayed on way too long. Uh -huh. And I saw that. You know, it was quite sad. With Rudolf really died with AIDS. But um, he tried to dance as long as possible. And Margot kept going back and back and back. And I was thinking, I'd say to Margot, you know, how can I say to this person I really adore, um, time to go to the beach. You know? <laughs> yes, time to, to an, another chapter. Not but, necessarily a bad one, but Act 3 can be different than Act 2. Yes, not be bad. exactly. And, right. it, and, it, and it can be joyful in a different way. But so at, when I sold Stars and I had, you know, and I went for two weeks to the Georges Cinq in Paris and spending my money and, you know, enjoyed Paris and I came back and I thought, okay, what next? Mm -hmm. So I sat at Zuni Cafe in San Francisco and made a list of what scared me. Did anything, I mean, how could anything scare me after the experience of, you know, what I'd just gone through for 30 years? Yes. And I thought, well, you know, um, sharks. Because I grew up in Australia and we, I had some bad moments in the water with sharks. So I thought, sharks really scare me. So I thought, okay, I'm going to learn to dive with sharks. And that brought my, you know, this obsessive adrenaline glands pumping, you know, 24-7. Um, and so I went dove with sharks, and so I was able to come down gradually from that without going crazy or becoming an alcoholic. Tempting, though that might be. <laughs> the way, oh, yeah. with, with your love of margaritas, and those are my favorite drinks as well. <laughs> uh, well, this is interesting to me because you talk about seeking the creative high irrespective of food. Here you're getting it from diving. Yes. And, uh, you know, that adrenaline rush. You know, you were introduced to food early on as a kid, discovering in and out right. of kitchens. Do you think you would have found food as the artistic medium had you not sort of stumbled into Chez Panisse and found food as a child? Do you think in the end you always would have found it, or could you have done anything? I, I wonder about that. You know, I mean, stumbling into Chez Panisse was, is the perfect way to put it, because I was, you know, had down to $25 in my, to my name. Luck, really, I would say. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, answering that ad. I mean, well, I was desperate. They were desperate, otherwise they wouldn't have given me the job. Um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it helped that I was not a very good architect, um, a lousy architect, probably. 
the only architecture I wanted to do was underwater, and everyone said that's you know that's hallucinogenic. Stop taking drugs. And we don't want to hear about that. Um, it didn't come from drugs. It came from you know then this burgeoning fascination with the oceans. So I tried that. Was broke, and this opportunity came up. So I stumbled into the kitchen. Absolutely. So whether I would have found that, I don't know. It's a fascinating question. Let me ask it in a different way. Are you drawn to food and feel that you must work with it? Oh, well, as a week ago, less than a week ago, when I stumbled out of my uh, hotel room in Sevilla and I saw this market, I looked through some windows, and it was the new central market, and I saw meat, and then I saw the fish, and I went, oh, my God. So I walked in, and they weren't really open, but they let me in because they saw me just with my face glued to the window. <laughs> and I thought, okay, right. I'm going to pop in here right now. I'm going to get a kitchen. I have to cook these perfect, beautiful, wonderful ingredients. So you are driven. You are driven, driven. to food in some Yeah, in, in some, some way. Way. Yes. Whenever that connection was made, if I see that pile of perfect baby cuttlefish, mm-hmm. you know, as I did at the market, I just think, okay, Where's my pan? Where's my? Where are I my must, friends? Yes. I have to cook lunch for everybody. Yes. Know? Oh, and that's interesting. Though that's another question I was going to ask you is, do you cook for yourself? Do you get that same joy? Or does, or does the joy really come from cooking for others? So is it making that perfect dish, be it just for you? or it No, has it, to it, has to, it has to involve people. I mean, I love buying the ingredients. I get a real rush off of that. Uh, I love g- taking them into the kitchen and preparing them and everything. But if I'm just going to... Sit for my cook it for myself. There's something really missing. Missing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I could have also titled this film "The Rise and Fall of Jeremiah Towers." Is there still a third act? And and as we've learned today, there is, and it involves olives. Right. Uh, so with this concept of the rise and fall, I wonder if you could pinpoint your greatest strengths and your strongest weaknesses. Ah, well, I mean, being stupid is probably, you know, my... Do you really think you're stupid now? Well, I've made some stupid mistakes, which is all part of it, you know. Sure. The I forget who it was, but somebody said, you know, your your greatness is measured by the chances you take. I would agree. And I read that eight months ago or something, I thought, wow, that's right on, you know, Uh, especially after having seen the movie ten times. But the rise and fall, after I sold Stars... The examiner did, the San Francisco examiner did, or the Chronicle did a story called that, The Rise and Fall. And I said to the writer who got a James Beard Award for the article, I said, the fall, let's see, but the fall was onto a first-class ticket to Paris, two weeks at the Georges V, which was the most wonderful, most expensive hotel in the world. You know it. Oh, yes, I worked there. In fact, the flowers out here in the lobby are from that guy, that American florist, who set that style internationally. Talking about somebody who changed the world, the face of that. I mean, that one man changed the way hotels do flowers and restaurants do flowers all over the world. Wow. The flowers on an angle? Uh-huh. Well, he did that. He was the first to do it at the Georges Cinq. Isn't that funny? I never would have... Everything you see out there florist, is exactly yes. his style. He's referring to the Four Seasons here in Beverly Hills. Yes, so, yeah. yes which is just a beautiful, lovely Magnificent, yes. yes. Magnificent. Really old, charming, and yet yeah. lovely and gorgeous. So the rise and fall. Um, I think my strengths are... Weaknesses are to make decisions that cause a fall. Though it wasn't... It was a fall into, as I say, you know... Uh, into the bar at the Fort, at the Shaw Sunken Paris. That's not not a it's bad not, fall. <laughs> that's the fall I would like. Just setting it up. I was for trying the to think of people. the thread count of the sheets, but I couldn't remember. <laughs> so. Yes, lovely. Hotel. They were probably linen. Um, and the, so the strengths and weaknesses are, I think, go absolutely hand in hand. Mm-hmm. It's taking chances, and my strength is to be able to recover yes. from making a terrible mistake. Um, you know, I mean, Elizabeth Taylor, that famous thing that she used to repeat to people, told me after the earthquake at Stars, she said, honey, when, you know, the going gets rough when there's a disaster, put on your lipstick, pour yourself a cocktail, and get on with it. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know about the lipstick, but the cocktail and getting on with it, I completely understood. Uh, and I think I could not have heard 
or believe more strongly in that phrase. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think I would agree as well. It's not really so much how much people fail, but what they learn from that and turn it around to go to the next thing. And get up. And get up. Because ultimately, I speak for myself here, but I'll say life is about experience more than wins. For me, I like to experience so many things, as many things as I possibly can. And that registers for me as very joyful, much more so than clocking this win versus that failure. I just don't keep that scorecard. Brilliantly said, and I realize now that you see it, I don't either. Uh, and that's what I mean about taking chances. Yes. You know? I mean, I, success, I tell young cooks, you know, as you're, these opportunities that came to me, I mean, all the things were sort of accidental, but I grabbed onto them. And it's like, you know, horses running by, um, you can either get out of the way or jump on, you know. And go for the ride. And go for the and ride. And it's that zest of life, right. I think, that comes through in your cooking, really, in the end. There right. is that joy that comes through in the cooking, and right. that, to me, was really stars. Uh, so I'll ask you, you've been out of it for a while. I mean, you did have that stint at the Tavern on the Green from 2014 to 2015, but you've kind of been out of the real thick of it for a while. What do you think of the food scene today? I think it's as, you know incredibly exciting what... All those things that we started back then, uh, not knowing we were starting anything, I have to say, but starting, um, all that influence, which has gone to you know, Australia and England and everywhere, um, is fantastic. And the, because the, I believe it all starts and ends with ingredients that a great chef finds the great ingredients and then stands behind them, does not grandstand, mm. just prepares them perfectly and simply, you know, and that's the true genius. But what's going on now is that that plate's put in front of you. You could be in Sydney, Hong Kong, Brisbane, Los Angeles, New York, San Francisco, Chicago, anywhere, you know, because the food is all, the plating is all starting to look the same. Not all starting, it has been for a few years. All those little dots. Yes. And am I supposed to take my fork and connect all the dots? You know, I use my finger. And then that sort of slide, uh, that sort of smear, you know, and I say, well, it looks like somebody took a cat's ass and gra- dragged it across the plate, you know. I mean, not appetizing. Not appetizing. And, you know, what is that carrot puree uh, smear, you know? I, that, all those things are great when the first chef does them, mm-hmm. when the genius, and whether you're in, in Spain, you know, and you create foam. Actually, when he tastes, you taste the stuff he did, it was an absolute miracle. It was light and perfumed. So you had wild mushrooms, a, you know, a teaspoonful of it, but it seemed like you had a whole basket of them. So then fast forward, you know, a year, and then everybody in the world is doing it, and they've got those little machines, and they think you just, you know, fluff them up and gas them and, and make foam. No. It was boring. It was stupid. It wasn't right. But the idea, so the inspiration from the first man or woman who did it Mm-hmm. That's what you is inspiring, but to just imitate it endlessly, thinking that will make you a three star Michelin or world famous chef, is wrong, and so that's what's going on now. I, I'm I'm thrilled to hear you say that because I actually feel that the food scene is becoming tired, boring, and, and because I <laughs> yes, because I feel that it is so nothing stands out anymore. Every there's lots of trying to top each other, but it's not food focused as much as it is presentation the the big right. marketing push the new restaurant that comes out the fanfare the press machine and so many of the dishes look the same and so many of the dishes are the same in terms of what they offer I'll tell you this maybe is not going to resonate with you but I'll tell you something that's very exciting for me is veganism and to see what how people yeah. are pushing themselves right. towards being creative there and doing some really interesting no, it's things. Brilliant. So I, I'm very excited about that. Well, I mean, the wonderful restaurant in Paris called La Pege, which I think, what now, uh, 20 years ago, or a little less, he said, he was three-star Michelin, and he said, I'm going to do become a vegetarian restaurant. And the whole cooking world went, what? Are you nuts? So I, of course, had to go see and I have not eaten there. And I used to live in Paris. So oh, really? I, yes. It's La Pêche. It's over by the Rodin Museum. Okay. Oh, I'm and one of my favorite museums. So I looked at this and I thought, you know, because I had always done that vegetable ragu that Richard Olney, the American writer who lived in France, simple French food, a book that all cooks should read. 
um, he taught me how to make this wonderful vegetable stew, and that got me really excited about a vegetable dish, you know, just water and vegetables and salt and pepper and Mm -hmm. olive oil. So he had on the menu truffle soup, and I thought, oh, it's that Bocuse thing with pastry and, you know, foie gras. No, I don't want that. And the chef came out and said, "That's, that's what you're having. And I said... Well, for a 50-euro supplement? I'm not so sure. He said, Jeremiah, it's on me. And out came this big, white, flat soup plate and filled up to the inner brim. It was a color, a puree. It was a color sort of Paris in the winter as a storm approaching. So, you know, that dove gray. Beautiful. Dark, a little darker than that. And it was a puree of black truffles and cream. And I just about passed out. Yeah. So... I- a vegetarian, a vegan, that because it had cream in it. Right, yeah. But you get the point. I do, I, mean, I do. I so do. that was maybe the best dish I've ever had in my life. And it was simple. Uh, uh, so since we're on this conversation and you are indulging me, I'll take it one step further. I'm very tired of seeing bacon in everything. It's, oh. just, to me, it just says, I don't know how to cook. Therefore, right. I'm going to put bacon in the ice cream, bacon in the chocolate, bacon in the whiskey, bacon in the pancakes, bacon in the donut. I just yeah. I, yeah. and then they put kale in everything after that. You know? As well, I'm really tired of <laughs> kale too. Yes, okay, people, we are demanding more from you. Uh, we are so limited on time here because I know you have many interviews right. today. So now I have just a bunch of quick questions that I want from you. Okay, favorite chef? Who's your favorite chef now and today? My in f- Chicago, in LA, around the world. Oh my goodness! I think well, it, off the top of my head, I'd say the Ledbury in London. Okay. Um, because he's got that. He doesn't do the dots and smears and everything. Um, that's my favorite restaurant at the moment. Okay, wonderful. And we touched on this a little bit before. So you saying that if you're cooking for yourself, there's sort of something missing. But do you cook for yourself? Do you have a go-to dish that you just always make on the fly? That's super easy. Yes, I love um, <clears throat> frittatas. Oh, okay. Because I take all the leftovers. I love to cook with leftovers. I think that's so intriguing because you don't know what you're going to do until you open the refrigerator door. It's like going to the market. You don't know what you're going to cook. You're going to cook whatever is in the market. So that's your refrigerator is your market. And so I think a little bit of this, a little bit of this, you know. And they're so easy to do. And they taste better if they've been sitting for an hour. And you can accept eggs and vegetables and olive oil and fresh herbs. I mean, Hello. I, I love this, too, because I love the challenge of I don't want anything to go to waste. So I just can't help it. It's how I was raised. Right. I just can't throw it out. Right. And so here I'm given this challenge, and there in life's the creativity is I have to use what's in my fridge. Right. And that's always fun Or you can make me. soup out of it as well. So what's the one dish that everyone should know how to make? Everyone should know how to make scrambled eggs the French style so that they're not dry and tough and everything because that's so easy. You put that on you know, a slice of bread... Um, of course, I'm not going to say you have to have black truffles to put in them, but if you do, um, I think everyone should know how to make a vegetable soup huh. because, uh, you know, if you're working as a writer all night, you know, you can have vegetable soup for breakfast. For me, again, it's emptying the refrigerator, but I, one of the greatest dishes I ever had was coming after a long lunch in the South of France with Richard Olney, who I talked about before, and there was nothing around, so he pulled out of the garden potatoes and leeks. So we had water, potatoes, leeks, cooked together, salt, and at the end of the table, a little olive oil on top, and it was just fabulous, much more fabulous than if it had been with chicken stock. It was just that purity of the vegetables. So I think everyone should know how to make something like that, and simple is always better. Simple this is, is what always I find. better, yeah. Um, so what if we were to go into your home right now, what would be in your fridge? What are you always going to have in your fridge? It's much, much more what's in the freezer that's interesting. Oh, okay. Yeah. Vodka, haagen Dulce de Leche ice cream. <laughs> so you've answered my next question, which yeah. is what's your favorite snack? Is it ice oh, cream? N- um, favorite snack, no, would probably be... Um, Perfect tomatoes on a saltine with Hellman's mayonnaise and salt and pepper on top of the tomato. Oh, <laughs> my Hellman's mayonnaise. Because Hellman's mayonnaise, it, I mean, I cannot stand the taste of it, mayonnaise that I haven't you know, made myself except for Hellman's. Really? Because it's a whole different thing. Oh. It's not really mayonnaise. Yeah. It's just, you know, because my, my aunt taught me to make, uh, in my books, and my aunt's coleslaw. 
and she uses Hellman mayonnaise. And I've tried it with making with real, real mayonnaise, not nearly as interesting. Really? Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, I've recently gone vegan, so I maybe won't consider Hellman's mayonnaise, but I'll have my boyfriend there you take, go. A, take a there pass you go. at So don't mayonnaise. you just put olive oil on the, on the cracker yes. and put the tomato um, or sardines, great sardines on, on toast. Yes, I great find snack. with tomatoes just even straight olives. Like straight olives. Just yeah, yeah. olives and tomato, yeah. little salad, and then on a cracker. Yeah. Fantastic. Perfect. Uh, so very last question, and maybe you saw this coming. You're on a show called The Celebrity Dinner Party. So right. who would you like to have dinner with? Ah, oh, and cook for, you mean, or have dinner with. That's different. Let's do a two, a, a, let's bifurcate the question. Okay. Who would you like to cook for, and who would you like to sit down and have okay. dinner with? Let's see. I would love to have sat down and have dinner with Lucius Beebe, uh, mm. the last, not the last Magnificent. Um, I loved cooking for Margaret Fontaine yeah. and Rudy together in my student apartment in, in uh, Somerville in Cambridge, Mass. Uh, really student apartment. And there she turned up in a white mink, you know, and black Armani. And, you know, and of course, this was a, you know, $50 a month apartment. <laughs> and, and she just dug into, you know, the roast beef and everything. Moments like that. So is there anyone around now? I'd love to have dinner with Tony. Berdan, Anthony mm, Berdan. Yes. Oh, yeah, sure. He would be fascinating, oh, he's of course. A, he's so intelligent and articulate yes. and a great guy. Yeah, and seems to be a warm-natured person. He is. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, just one tiny more question now that I've got you, because you're making me think of this. Do you entertain at home? I mean, here you used to entertain so many at Stars. Do you have dinner parties at home? Yes, I do. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And six, eight, ten, twelve? Oh, no, I mean uh, six. 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 So is, really intimate dinner six parties. Six is good, yeah. There's nothing better. I've done the, you know, the 500 parties. I just cooked uh, dinner for 300 people at Oxford University in one of the colleges for the Financial Times Festival. Uh, it was a huge success, uh, which I didn't know whether it was going to be or not. Uh, so that was fun. But I don't, don't think I'll do that anymore. Yeah. Okay. Well, I always feel like there's nothing, there's no better way to connect with people than right. to cook for them in your home in Absolutely. a small, intimate group, and it's going to forge a friendship that will last forever. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Jeremiah, thanks for speaking Thank with you. me today. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks for joining in on The Celebrity Dinner Party with me, Elizabeth Alfano. To stay in the know, follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at Dinner Party CHGO, and on Facebook at Elizabeth Alfano and at The Dinner Party. To subscribe to this podcast, find The Celebrity Dinner Party on iTunes and on SoundCloud. And if you want to send me an email about today's podcast or anything else, you can find all my information at www.thedinnerparty.tv. The editor of The Celebrity Dinner Party is Andrew Jensen. And the interns are Wesley Johnson and Olivia Shennison. The music is provided by the Websters and Ship Captain Crew. Thanks for listening today, and join me on the next Celebrity Dinner Party podcast, where the best conversations happen over dinner.